Good morning. It is a joy to be together on this third Sunday of Advent, a Sunday also known as Gaudete Sunday, which means to rejoice. And so that's why we light the pink candle on the third Sunday of Advent, because that's the candle of joy. It's a, it's a time that we remember that as we prepare in this season of Advent for the coming of Christ at Christmas. I want to uh, welcome all of you to the service of worship. Uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, glad that you are here and hope that you come back again next week as well. And I want to welcome all the folks that are worshiping with us online this morning too. Draw your attention to a few announcements. We had a wonderful response at our breakfast with Santa last Sunday. I know a number of folks came uh, to come see Santa and tell you, tell them what you wanted for Christmas and got some pictures. Uh, we do have the pictures just outside in the lobby. So if you uh, took one and, and need to pick that up, they're just right out there. Um, so be sure to do that. You might have also seen uh, some of the Keith Memorial UMC 2021 uh, Christmas ornaments that uh, Alex Barlock, our Director of Communications, and Robin McGowan, one of our volunteers, made. There's a limited supply. They're just asking for donations, but um, if you'd like to, to get these, uh, be sure to pick them up this morning because I don't think they'll last very long. They're very, uh, very pretty, so we're thankful for them for making those. We also have a new way, an easy way to give. You can text Keith Give. Uh, there's a number there listed on your bulletin, and it tells you how to set that up. You'll also see a pledge card um, in your bulletin this morning. Back in November, Dave and I preached a sermon on um, kind of our vision for 2022, and one of the, those things was to think about how you might give in this next year. So I encourage you to fill these out and put them in the, in the um, offering baskets this morning. You can also see on the tear-off portion of your bulletin some information about our Luminary Nativity Walk, which we're excited about. That's going to be this evening at 6.30, right here in the front of the church. Um, this is a tradition that we started last year and just really enjoyed and loved, and uh, would love for you to come and be a part of that. Um, it's a wonderful way to hear the Christmas story through the mouths of children in, in such a beautiful way, and so hope that you can come and be a part of that. There's going to be refreshments and singing after that, where's that going to be? Is that going to be in here? That'll be in here in the gathering. So you can go through the luminary walk and then come up here and uh, share in that time together. We're also having our Christmas Eve meal this year. You can see ways to sign up for that to help volunteer as well. So I encourage you to do that. And you can also do that on our uh, website as well. And I know that we've got a live nativity going on um, on Christmas Eve. And so if you have any questions about that or would like to volunteer, we would love to have your help. You can call us at the church office. You can talk and I will need lots of help. So if you'd like to stand out and be a wise man or a shepherd, um, we'd love for you to be a part of that this year. At this time, let's now prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we go to the Lord in prayer. Oh God, in this time of worship, may we be open to your promises, your love, and your transformation. May we vision and dream. May we be surprised. May we receive the life you give us. And may we encounter Emmanuel, God, with us. And may we never be the same. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. At this time, I want to invite Rachel and Gracie, Gracie to come up and share in our lighting of the Advent candles this morning. Reading from Matthew 1, 8, chapter 1, 18 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to the public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will, sa for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no material relations, relations with her until she had born a son, and he, and he named him Jesus. 
Throughout history, most of the church's attention in the Christmas story has been drawn to the angel's surprising announcement to Mary that she would bear a son. But her fiancé Joseph received an unexpected announcement from the angel of the Lord as well. That announcement came to him in a, came to him in a dream and assured him that Mary had not been unfaithful to him, but that God was being faithful to all humankind. Her child was from the Holy Spirit. He was to be called Jesus, which means Savior, for he would save us from our sins. In his birth, we recall the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah long before the birth of a child named Emmanuel, which means God is with us. In this book of Advent Reflections, Hope for the Holidays, Reverend Andrew Lay writes that writes the, Chris, the story of Christmas is a story that tells us that God is with us. Christmas reminds us that God has not left us alone through the through the good and the bad, but we are not alone. In his dream, Joseph received the best news of all. News of all, God is with us. So today, on this third Sunday in Advent, we light the third candle on our Advent wreath to join Joseph's enlightenment to, to the enlightenment of his fiance Mary, and to the ancient enlightenment of the prophet Isaiah, to the best news of all that we are not alone, that God is with us in Jesus Emmanuel. Let us pray. Ever-present God, by your grace, grant that we all may come to experience even more personally and profoundly your presence with each one of us in Jesus Emmanuel and to know even more deeply in our heart of hearts that in him we are never alone, that you are always with us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you stand with us as you're able?
We've now come to our prayer time this morning, and I have a number of joys that I want to lift up and share with you all. Last Sunday, we had our Hanging of the Greens service and had a wonderful time as we uh, decorated the sanctuary, prepared our hearts and minds for Advent, for the coming of Christmas. That was just a wonderful uh, service that we were able to have, not having it last year, and so it was, it was wonderful to be able to do that. On Monday, we uh, handed out hot chocolate to folks during the Christmas parade, and so that was a joy as well. I want to thank Bev Stansel and everybody who helped. Uh, come and make that possible. On Tuesday, we had our Tri-County uh, Christmas party hosted by the home service uh, class, and it's always a joy uh, to see them gather together and to get their gifts and to see uh, Santa Claus, and uh, just a wonderful time. So I want to thank everyone for, uh, for helping out with that. And then Friday, uh, our Keith Children's Academy had their uh, preschool Christmas program here in the gathering, and that was a joy as well. I want to thank Tracy Hicks and all of her staff uh, for putting that together. It was just a wonderful time. And then last night, um, we had our parents' night out, and I want to thank Reagan and all the volunteers for that. I think I had 16 kids uh, come to that, so that was a wonderful uh, time as well. I know some of the parents enjoyed that break a little bit of time to, to do what they need to do, so that was certainly a joy. It's also a joy. Uh, Brittany Burke Pickle um, had her second child, Poppy Lee Pickle, uh, this past week, and so we can celebrate that, that birth as well. Also a joy, uh, Wayne Graves. This is Caleb Graves and Abby Robinson Grave. Uh, that's Caleb's father. Um, he is back home after 222 days in the hospital um, from COVID. And so I know that he spent a long, long time in the hospital. Glad that he is back home. So that is a joy uh, that we can lift up and share uh, together. Um, I think we can lift up all those folks that are dealing with with hospitalization and do things like that, but, but, but a joy to, to be able to celebrate that for Wayne. Are, are there other joys that we can lift up and share with one another uh, this morning? Yes, Katie. The twins are nine, so happy birthday. Yeah, all right. Yes. Just got accepted to grad school on Friday. Congratulations. Where, where are you going? Penn State Online. Oh, that's awesome. Great. It's certainly a joy. Thank you for sharing that this morning. Any other joys we want to lift up and share? Well, we do have a number of folks that we want to continue to lift up. You can see on the back of your bulletin our prayer list. I want to encourage you to take that home with you and uh, pray for these folks uh, throughout the week. I uh, certainly want to lift up all those folks that were affected by the thunderstorms and tornadoes that came through this past weekend. I know that uh, affected a number of folks. also want to lift up Jean Patrick. This is Chan Patrick's uh, mother uh, who is diagnosed with stage 4 uh, liver, liver cancer. And so we want to lift up Chan and his family and his mother um, during this time as well. Are there other concerns that we can lift up? Yes, you can. Say that for me one more time. I'm going to get a little closer. We'll pray for your dad's back. He's dealing with some pain. And he wants it to heal up, and it's not healing up quick enough. So absolutely, that's a good thing to pray for. Thank you, Cannon. Yes, Becky. Hmm. Absolutely. We'll lift up Morgan as she's dealing with that diagnosis. Absolutely. Are there other concerns? Do any of us have unspoken requests which we would acknowledge by the lifting of our hands this morning? As always, you can let us know how we can come alongside you in your joys and in your concerns. You can email us at prayer at keithumc.org, um, or you can come talk to me after the service. We're always happy to know how we can, can join you in that. This time, let us now go to the Lord in prayer. Gracious God, on this third Sunday of Advent, 
we await the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ. And as we wait, we are filled with hope and peace, knowing that you will restore our hearts, refine our spirits, and mold us and shape us into your loving disciples. Loving God, you are the Emmanuel, God with us. Help us to remember that your presence is always with us, whether we realize it or not. You are closer to us than our next breath. And we thank you for your constant presence among us. During the season of Advent, as we busy ourselves with all of the preparations for Christmas, help us to slow down and remember why you have come to us. Forgive us for when we fail to realize your true purpose for this season of hope and peace. We thank you for all of the blessings that you have given to us. There's so much that we have to be joyful about. We celebrate all the good things that are going on in our lives knowing that you are the giver of good things. This morning we also offer our prayers for those who are in pain, those who are dealing with difficult circumstances. We know that you hear the concerns of our hearts. This morning, help us to share in the ministry of presence with one another. May we reach out in service and in love. And may we accept the gift of your Son this Christmas. And may we offer his love to others. For we ask all these things in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We do have baskets in the back and baskets up here in the front. You're invited to come and bring your offering. And when you do, you can also light a candle for someone and kneel in prayer. So let's continue our worship this morning.
Well, this morning we are continuing our Advent sermon series entitled The Christmas Prophet as we look at the Christmas message according to the prophet Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is full of Christmas images. Isaiah introduces the theme of the virgin birth and the name Emmanuel long before the Gospels of the New Testament. Isaiah's prophecies are full of messianic expectation. And, and they're rich with messages of, of peace and justice. So Isaiah is really the perfect Christmas prophet to guide us on this journey through the season of Advent. This morning, we're looking at the promise of Emmanuel. Our scripture comes from Isaiah 7, starting with verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask a sign from the Lord your God. Make it as deep as the grave or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said... I won't ask. I won't test the Lord. Then Isaiah said, Listen, house of David, isn't it enough for you to be tiresome for people that you are also tiresome before my God? Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. The young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son, and she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat butter and honey and learn to reject evil and choose good. Before the boy learns to reject evil and choose good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. King Ahaz is not known as a righteous king. He's not been listening to God. He's not been listening to the prophet Isaiah. 
Besides, he doesn't have time to do that. He doesn't have the time to deal with spiritual matters because he's simply too busy dealing with the political issues surrounding him. King Ahaz is in the midst of the Syro-Ephraimite war. Ahaz, who is the king of Judah and whose kingdom is centered in Jerusalem, is being attacked by the northern king of Israel and Damascus. There's a a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. Ahaz is in the southern kingdom. And these northern kings are wanting to overthrow Ahaz and replace him with somebody who will join them in their fight against the Assyrians. Assyrians are attacking the Israelites from the north. Ahaz is in Judah, and he does nothing to help them. Instead, Ahaz joins in with the Assyrians. He sees that it's inevitable that they will win. They're too strong of an army. And so he, he throws his lot in with the Assyrians in order to really protect his own kingdom, to protect the, the city of Jerusalem from being attacked and overthrown. But deep down, Ahaz knows that after they come for, for the folks in the north, they're likely to come for him next. He knows that the Assyrians are a real threat to his kingdom. And so Ahaz is in this uncertain time. He's unsure of what to do. And the people are unsure as well. There's panic. The people don't feel safe. They've experienced war, violence, oppression. They distrust the government and the leadership. It's a dark time for the history of the Jewish people. And it's during this dark time that God tells Ahaz to ask God for a sign. Think about that. God tells Ahaz to ask God for a sign. Uh, that's kind of interesting because, because typically we're sort of the ones that initiate that kind of thing. As human beings, we don't typically need God to tell us to ask God for a sign. Uh, that's a conclusion that we come to on our own. Usually, um, when we are in the midst of a difficult and dark time, When we're in a season of uncertainty, we ask God for a sign without any prompting or prodding. Besides, don't we all want a sign from God? I mean, I think that's something that all of us have either asked for or thought about asking for at some point in our lives. After all, wouldn't it be great to hear directly from God about something going on in our lives? Wouldn't it be great to receive a sign from God telling us what we need to know, telling us what we need to do. We want signs, right? We want indications of of what's going on. We want confirmation and affirmation. We want signs. We like signs when they fit our agenda. But oftentimes, you know, we don't do a very good job of seeing the signs that God has already placed around us. We don't do a good job of living into the call that God has already placed on our lives. We're often too blind to see God's signs. My favorite television show is uh, a a show called The West Wing. It's not on anymore, but you can watch the reruns. And there's an episode entitled, Take This Sabbath Day. And in the episode, we see uh, President Josiah Bartlett uh, dealing with a difficult decision. He's deliberating on whether or not to save a prisoner from the death penalty. Supreme Court has already denied the prisoner's appeals, and so the only person that can intervene at this point is the president. And so he's, he's thinking about things much like King Ahaz. He's unsure of what to do. And so President Barley calls upon a priest from his childhood parish, Father Tom Cavanaugh. And while the two men are sitting in the Oval Office, talking about this decision that the president has made, Father Cavanaugh tells a story. He says, you remind me of the man who lived down by the river. He heard on a radio report that the river was going to flood and that all the residents should evacuate and uh, leave their homes. But the man said, I'm religious. I pray. God loves me. God will save me. Well, the waters rose up. And then along came a guy in a rowboat. And he said, hey, sir, the town is flooding. Come climb into my rowboat and I'll take you to safety. But the man shouted back, I'm religious. I pray God loves me. God will save me. A little while later, the the water 
continues to rise, and, and then a helicopter comes hovering overhead, and a guy in a megaphone shouts out, hey you down there, the town is flooding. Climb up here into this helicopter and I'll take you to safety. And the man says, no you don't understand, I'm a religious man. I pray, God loves me, God will save me. Well, the man drowned. And standing at the gates of St. Peter, this man demanded an audience with God. He said, Lord, I'm a religious man. I pray, I thought you loved me. Why didn't you save me? Why did this happen? And God said, I sent you a radio report, sent you a guy in a rowboat, sent you a guy in a helicopter. What in the world are you doing here? You know, we often want a sign from God, but we don't always do a great job of seeing those signs that are all around us. King Ahaz is unsure of what to do. He doesn't know what's going to happen. And here God comes and says, Hey, Ahaz, ask me for a sign and I'll give it to you. Ask me what's going to happen and I'll tell you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't this such a great opportunity to hear directly from God about a decision in a difficult time. But strangely enough, Ahaz doesn't want to ask God for a sign. He refuses. He says he doesn't want to test the Lord. Now, when we hear that, we think, okay, that's not, that's not too bad because, you know, the, the Bible warns against testing God. Jesus says that. Don't test the Lord, thou God. In fact, in the, in the book of Deuteronomy, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And so on the surface, it appears like Ahaz is simply following God's law. But I wonder if that's really what's going on here. We get the sense that maybe Ahaz is reluctant to ask for a sign, not because he would be testing the Lord, but because he's afraid of what that sign might suggest. As the great Protestant reformer Martin Luther once said, impious Ahaz simulates a holy attitude which says that he does not wish to request a sign because he fears God. Thus, the hypocrites, when it's not necessary, are most religious. On the other hand, when they ought to be humble, they are most haughty. Perhaps Ahaz is a hypocrite. Perhaps he is is acting religious only when it suits him. Maybe Ahaz is worried that a sign from the Lord might go against his agenda. Maybe he's worried that a sign from the Lord might threaten his authority and power. Maybe he's worried that a sign from the Lord might bring about unwelcome change in his life. He thinks he's got it all figured out. He doesn't need help. He doesn't want help. He wants to be in control. And even though Ahaz is against receiving this sign from God, Isaiah the Christmas prophet speaks out anyway. That's often the job of a prophet, sharing God's word to people who don't want to listen telling folks the hard truth, telling people the difficult facts, telling people things that they don't want to hear. Up till this point, Isaiah has shared nothing but bad news. God is holding the people accountable. There is judgment. There is need for repentance. Things are not going well for the Jewish people. But then we hear this sign from God. The young woman is pregnant and is about to give birth to a son. And she will name him Emmanuel. He will eat butter and honey and learn to reject evil and choose good. Before the baby learns to reject evil and choose good, the land of the two kings you dread will be abandoned. What a miraculous sign from God through someone as seemingly ordinary as a young woman. This is the news of a child, Emmanuel, that will bring about real and lasting change. Scholars suggest that this prophecy is likely speaking about a young woman who's already with child during the time of this prophecy, during the time of Isaiah. And we don't know if this woman uh, is a concubine of Ahaz or she might be the wife of the prophet. Uh, We don't really know. We're not told. We're not given any of these details. It's mysterious and vague, but we can assume that the prophet is talking about somebody within his own life. Lifetime, somebody with own, within his own time in history. Now, of course, when we hear this prophecy, we're reminded of another young teenage girl, we're reminded of another child, another baby. 
We think of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. Mary is engaged to Joseph, and she becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And when Joseph hears about this, he decides to call off their engagement and dismiss Mary quietly in order to keep from her from humiliation. And so as Joseph is thinking about this, he's visited by an angel in a dream. And the angel says, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you will call him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And then the Gospel of Matthew goes on to point back to the Old Testament passage in Isaiah and says, now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet will be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Isaiah first introduces this theme of Emmanuel, God with us. And then the Gospel of Matthew points to how this prophecy is ultimately fulfilled through the birth of Jesus Christ at Christmas. Jesus is God made flesh, the God who comes to live and dwell among us. We're told of a God who is with us in our joys and in our sorrows. A God who is with us in good times and in bad. A God who is with us in all of our ups and downs. A God who is with us even when we don't realize it. God is with us. And this is what we are invited to celebrate at Christmas. We're invited to accept God's presence into our lives, knowing that we are never alone. God is with us. And not only that, but we're also invited to share the ministry of presence with one another. So we can know that God is with us, but we have an opportunity to let other folks know that they are not alone. I think that's something that we take uh, for granted. How often do we just sit with someone? Take the time to just sit with somebody. How can we put down our phones, shut our mouths, open our ears, and simply be with someone? In such a busy season, how can we stop? How can we slow down and participate in this ministry of presence, who do you need to go see? Who do you, you need to go sit with? Who do you need to share in the ministry of presence with? The theologian Henry Nouwen once said this, It is difficult not to have plans. Not to organize people around an urgent cause and not to feel that you are working directly for social progress. But I wonder more and more if the first thing shouldn't be to know people by name, to eat and drink with them, to listen to their stories and tell your own, and to let them know with words, handshakes and hugs, that you simply do not simply like them but you truly love them. We serve a God who enters into our world. We serve a God who comes to us in the flesh to live and dwell among us. At Christmas, we celebrate that the Creator of the universe walks on earth among us as Emmanuel, God with us. Let us pray. Ever-present God, at Christmas you promise us your presence to come and live and dwell among us. We thank you for the gift of Emmanuel, God with us. We thank you for being a God that is with us in good times and in bad times. We thank you for always being with us no matter where we are or what we are doing. Help us to live into this ministry of presence. May we find ways to be with one another. To be with one another. To reach out in love and faith. And may we put down the things that distract us 
so that we can focus on the people and the things that truly matter. May we live into this call to love God, to love our neighbor, and to love ourselves. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us, Israel? Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born While shepherds kept the watching For silent flocks by night Behold, throughout the heavens, there's shown a world in I Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Shepherds fear to tremble when low above the earth. Break out the angel chorus that held our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain. Jesus Christ is born. Now in a lonely manger, our humble Christ was born. And God sent us salvation that blessed Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain. Christ is born. And go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. That Jesus Christ is born. That Jesus Christ is born. And for joining us in this time of worship as we journey closer and closer to the Christmas season. Hope that you can come and be a part of our Christmas Eve services as well. Looking forward to that time together. Um, next Sunday, we are going to have our Christmas cantata, so we'll be down in the sanctuary for that. Um, but looking forward to that time together. At this time, I invite you to receive this benediction. Arise and go in peace. And may God's love be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>